Hi, welcome to the June episode of Vegetables Matter. This is a craft cast about my fiber life. Um, this time that means crocheting, knitting, dyeing. Um, often it, it also includes spinning, but I don't have any spinning this time. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about my garden and chickens at the end. Um, that was kind of my intent with this craft cast was to incorporate that and I haven't been doing that well. Who knows if that'll work out that well this time or not. Um, it had been winter and it's just been cold, but now things are happening and I'm eating strawberries and all those things. So um, let's get started. Um, I just got back from a summer solstice trip. So I do a trip every solstice and equinox and just had the summer solstice trip, I went up to Wyoming, um, well, went up, went to the sun tunnels in Utah, I live in Utah, so went there first and then up to my parents-in-law's place um, in Wyoming and then farther on up into the Bighorn Mountains where it was very cold. We, uh, yeah, it was pretty snowy. <laughs> um, it's a little strange to be back here and be like, oh, it's actually hot. I was, I thought I'd hit the summer solstice and things were going to be getting cooler from here on out as the days get shorter. But now I'm back home and, and it's not even crazy hot yet. It's probably in the 80s, but it's feeling hot. So, um, on the trip, I brought a number of things. That's mostly what I'm going to share here are things that I was working on on that trip. Um, yeah, I think just about everything is. So, we're gonna start off with crochet. The reason that I'm really pushing to get this um, this film today is that um, the one finished object that I have that I'll show you um, is a, a gift for a friend, a, a solstice gift actually. So I really wanna get it to her. So I thought, okay, I, I need to record first. So I was working on this last time and showed it. I was having a really good time with it. It continued to be fun. I definitely had to rip back a few times, but this is my finished Starburst tote. There is the body, and then there are two handles. Voila. Um, yeah, I think it turned out really well. I really like it. I think it's going to be a pretty special bag. Um, let's see. So I said this is the Starburst tote, and this is uh, designed by Nomad Stitches. Also, I should mention, I've never mentioned it before, but I do put the timestamps down below. So you can click on like more in my description and you can see all the timestamps for when I start talking about different things and I give the pattern name and the designer. So if you're interested in any of that info, you can look there. Um, this is all made out of hemp. Um, you can see this is just kind of typical hemp that, that you would think of. And then these greens are some hemp that I got a long time ago um, and I've already made some things out of. and. My friend loves green and I was looking at what greens I had and this is kind of what I came up with. So, um, I guess what should I say about it? I did do a little modification. It was a little bit tricky to follow the pattern as was because this, this hemp here is thinner than this stuff and so I kind of just have, had to keep doing little modifications to make it straight. Um, instead of doing, I think she had like a double crochet with a chain for all of this stuff, um, I ended up doing a V stitch instead. So I think that's pretty much the change. And then you get to just do the handles however you want. Um, yeah, it was it was really fun. I really like the result, and I would love to make more of Nomad Stitches patterns. If you look her up on Ravelry, she has a lot of amazing things. Um, oh yeah, that reminds me. So I know it's not till next year, but projecting, at least for me, takes a really long time. So, you know, it's a long-term thing. So next year will be the um, uh, Summer Olympics. And, you know, people do like the Ravelinic games or whatever, but I know it started off with the Yarn Harlot doing the, what she call it? The Olympics, but the Fiber Olympics? I'm, I'm blanking. I, I should know this stuff, but I think, I think a time when the Winter Olympics were in Canada or something is maybe when she started it and she like knit this sweater, you know, in the time that, uh, that the Olympics took place and people really took off with this and then they were start wanting to do it for the Winter Olympics and the Summer Olympics and she kind of came out just being like, 
you know, for me, it's like each sport just happens every four years. It doesn't happen all the time. Um, and people do all sorts of different things with it, but how she really saw it was that the Winter Olympics are, are the Knitting Olympics. Um, and then she thought, you know, there could be another sport for the Summer Olympics. And she says, crochet anyone? And it was a hilarious blog post. You should look it up if you haven't read it. It really got me laughing. <laughs> um, and so I really loved that idea. So for me, the Winter Olympics, you do a knitting project. The Summer Olympics, you do a crochet project. Um, last year, 2000, uh, 2018, um, it would have been my first time doing it, and I just did it completely personally. I didn't do anything, you know, teams or anything like that. Um, but I made my first Fair Isle project, some Fair Isle mittens um, within that time. That was really, really fun. Um, so I thought, okay, you know, next year it'll be the Summer Olympics. What, what should it be? And I really think that it'll be like a, a shirt or a dress or something designed by Nomad Stitches. She does really beautiful work, and I think that would be a really fun project. So anyway, far in the future, but that's kind of the idea right now. Um, yes, beautiful bag. Here it is. Um, going along with the crochet, um, I've already showed you my Turtle Tracks blanket by Lisa Naskrit, but it's been quite a while, um, and I did work on it on this trip. So I thought that I would give a little update on it. Um, yeah, I'd kind of been working on it just a little bit here and there. And then I decided to bring it on this trip, even though it was summer solstice, because I thought, you know, I think it's going to be cold enough up there that it'll be fun to be working on a blanket. And sure enough, it worked out one day. I just said one day. I think I only did three rows, but I decided to show it because I had been working on it beyond that um, in the intervening months. So I can't see what's happening. Yeah, it's getting sizable. Oh, that cable's showing up nicely. So this is these crocheted cables. Let's see, I guess technically it actually goes more like this. There we go. Um, let's see, how do I... So I'm forgetting now how many skeins I already have in it. Um, I have eight skeins total. This was given to me by Lynn from Spinderella's, and I have eight skeins total. So this is the body of the blanket, and then you do do a border all around the, the edges of it. So my idea was to do six of the skeins in the body of the blanket, and then keep the, the two for the border. And I remember also, I was looking through some notes of mine recently, and I came across notes for this. And the idea was to have it be a three by three. I changed the size. She gives a few different sizes for it. And just to maximize the amount of yarn that I had, I kind of did it in between um, some of them. So, hmm, I don't know. I don't remember. I'll figure it out. Um, but yeah, I, I'm getting close-ish on the body. I might have one more skein that I get to do in it. I think so. That, make, that would make sense. Um, yeah, and then I'll do the border. So slowly working on that. Don't know how much more I'll get done this summer, but um, yeah, it's nice to have this this project in the background for when I don't know what else to work on, or even when I do, and I can just say, "Ooh, fun little crochet project." Okay, those are the crocheted items. Let's move on to knitting. Um, a first. Just small little project that I finished up real quick after I finished up the uh, the bag there was another one of the geometric teethers. I think I had one or two of these done, and I just needed to do um, the third one. So I ended up choosing this green to go with it, but I guess I'd forgotten about how much yarn you need, and I ran out of the green. So I thought, oh, that's fine. It'll be cute if I just add another color. So this one is just about done although I do actually still need to um so you with this geometric teether sorry I've showed this before so I'm not giving a great introduction um let me show a different one so you have a square a triangle and a circle and then I felt these that's why I haven't woven in my ends at all because I'll felt them um and then it's just a cute little baby toy um, I've already felted one and given it away, and now I have four more. And I think these ones are already sewed up to make them the squares and the triangles, but then I just need to do this. 
and then I, I was I was kind of waiting for um, to finish this one up before I felted them but I think now um, I'll felt this batch and then I can give them out to some friends with babies before those babies get too old that they don't care <laughs> gotta get on it yeah so that was a fun little thing to finish up okay the other thing I've been working on um, that I'm a little bit stuck on and need some advice from someone more experienced than I am. Um, so I've mentioned that I'm not a sock knitter, um, but this is a pair of socks. So I've knit two pairs of socks in the past, and this is my third pair that I'm working on. Um, so Maria from Ninja Chickens, and I think a few other people, um, I know in particular Mars from Hey Brown Berry as well, in fact, she might be the one properly hosting it. Um, they are doing a successful make-along, so successful. Really encouraging people to be knitting socks. Um, so along with this, they got some designers to um, offer up some patterns, um, and you, you're, you can get one pattern for free, and then I think you can get other patterns for maybe 50% off or something like that. Um, I did like a, a Google search for Hey Brownberry successful make along. Um, and a, a page came up that was really useful. It showed all the patterns that you could get. Um, I looked through them and I chose one. So they got me. They're wanting people to, to get more into making socks. Or, you know, I know a lot of people already are and just celebrating that, but also kind of trying to get other people into it. So I thought, okay, you're going to get me. That's tempting enough for me. So I looked um, at that page and found the Near and Far pattern by Hannah Lisa Hafferkamp. I'm not sure how to pronounce that name. So this is what it looks like. Um, and I think this picture back here shows those cables better. Yeah, so just a super pretty sock. Um, it's toe up, which I've only ever done toe up, so that's good. I, in the past, I've done two at once, and this time, just because I wanted to swatch with it, um, so rather than making two, then I just did one, and I kept thinking, oh, maybe I'll set that aside and then cast on the other, get to the same place and do two at once, but I haven't done that, so I'm just doing one at a time, and it's making me nervous because I don't want to have to deal with second sock syndrome, but whatever. I'm, I'm a little stuck right now, although I just keep going, <laughs> but slowly, um, and so I think it... Right now I am feeling like, yeah, I just want to be working on one instead of maybe screwing up two at the same time. Um, this is my first time knitting cables properly. I guess a long time ago I did a little bit of cabling on a scarf. Um, I just kind of made it up. Um, pretty simple, but just a few twists every now and again. Um, yeah, but other than that, this is like my first proper cabling with knitting. Obviously, I'm doing the crochet cabling as well. It's kind of fun to be working on both crochet cabling and knitting cabling at the same time. Crochet cabling is so nice because you're not ever going to drop a stitch. <laughs> you just go exactly, you know, you just put your needle in wherever you, or your hook in wherever you need it to go. Um, so, my issue with this, oh yeah, let me show you the actual thing. Isn't that pretty? I love the little cable. It's awesome. So... Okay, also the other ones, the other socks that I've done, they were both the same pattern. Um, it was more just a recipe that someone had. It was lovely to follow, made perfect sense to me. But it's, it, I don't know what you would call it. I, I'm not familiar enough with socks to kind of know the different terminology. But it was not a heel flap and gusset. There's definitely a gusset, and I felt like I turned the heel, but there was no heel flap, I guess. This does have a heel flap, but she says for my size that five and a quarter inches, five and a quarter inches, like I think she says 13 centimeters, five and a quarter inches before the end of my foot, before the heel, I was supposed to start the gusset increases. Well, I got farther than that before I even looked because I was like, oh, I clearly need more, more of this before I start worrying about the, the heel. Um, and so I think I only had like four inches before I started the gusset. I was like, that seems good. I don't think I want to tear this out. I don't want, I mean, five and a quarter. Like, look at my foot. <laughs> Sorry, it's probably dirty. Um, you know, I think, I think I would have to start at basically the toe. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to start there for the heel increases. So I didn't. Um, but there, to me, it still seems really early. Four inches. 
So I'm just kind of nervous. I don't really know. I have gotten to the point, I think I'm just there, where I would start doing, um, oh yeah, in fact I did. I already put the top of the, um, the top of the sock on a different needle so that then I can start doing, um, the heel turn. So, but I don't really know sizing. I don't really know, like, is this the proper point to be doing it? I think it's good. I keep trying it on my foot. And it's like, yeah, I, I think that'll work. But I don't really know what's going to happen when I put the heel flap in and how that connects and how that works. So anyway, I've, I've kind of just thought, you know what? If it is a total failure, I'll just rip it out and try it again. You know, it's not going to be that bad. So anyway, there's this little beauty. Oh, so I've... I don't know if I mentioned, so this is not a sock yarn, this is DK, it's a little bit thicker. Um, I have 54 stitches, um, let's see, I was going to say something else, sock, oh yeah, um, I was definitely wanting a paler colors to really show the cable um, in the pictures that I was seeing. I really liked the ones that that were not as dark of a color so you could really see that cable. Um, however, I wasn't going to go for white at all. Um, in fact, I bought some other yarn but it was the wrong, yeah, <laughs> it was the wrong weight and I, and I thought, oh, I'll just modify it. And I was like, no, I don't want to modify it. I want to make it simple for myself. Just get the actual weight of yarn and call it good. I should say these are on size 2 needles, US size 2. Um, anyway, so I ended up getting this white and I thought, okay, after I knit them, maybe I will dye them. Um, so it's still definitely a possibility, although I find that I'm actually really liking them white as well. So we'll see if I end up dyeing them or not. That is the plan, but we will see. You can see it's like getting really big and gappy here, but it fits. So, so far, so far so good. But lots of questions. Okay. Those are my two knitting things I was going to share. Next up is dyeing. Um, yeah, so I have two things I'm going to share with dyeing. I already showed you um, the results from the dock dye bath last time. Um, just a reminder, this is it. I still haven't rinsed it. Actually, when I finish this, I'm going to throw this in some water and get it rinsing. Um, it still is not showing up as pretty as it really is. Wait, can I do this thing? That might be a little nicer. Anyway, it's a really pretty golden color. Um, at the same time that I did this, this is just kind of a, a traditional, you know, heating water, blah, 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 all of that stuff. Um, traditional dye bath like that. Um, we also did a fermented dye bath. So this was mordanted wool, but I had read that you can, you still process the, um, the plant the same way. So you, you know, boil that or simmer it or whatever, um, you know, for a couple hours, but then we just took that out, let it cool. And then we added some unmordanted fiber and let it sit. Well, I plan to let it sit for a week, but I forgot about it. And I think it ended up sitting for two, maybe three weeks. Um, and then I saw it and I was like, oh yeah. So this is unmordanted fiber and it's rinsed and everything. And look at this gorgeous orange. Oh, I love it. So pretty. Ugh. There you go. See that darker color that you see in here? It's more like that. Ah, oh, isn't that pretty? I love it. Um, yeah, when I get close, it just washes out. So this is, um, yeah, this is rinsed already. This is not yet rinsed, but look at these cool colors I got from Doc. I would definitely try it again, especially this uh, fermentation, and you don't have to mordant. So awesome. So that's one of the um, dye baths I wanted to share. The other one is my sister came to town, and we did that matter dye bath that I've been talking about. She has taken the yarn away. Um, she's back in Oregon now and she has it. So I can't show it to you, but she's taken some pictures. And my idea is, and I'm not going to talk about it right now, 
but I'm going to insert the pictures and then when I do that, then I'll do like a little narration talking about what's happening with it. Um, one thing I will say about matter is that here in Utah, we have hard water, which means that there's basically already the calcium carbonate in the water. So um, we don't need to add the chalk or calcium carbonate um, to get some nice reds. Although this is the second time I've dyed with matter and this time did turn out less vibrant and probably a little bit less red than, in fact, a lot less red. Before I really got like these deep reds. So maybe the water's not quite as hard as it was when I dyed um, the first time or who knows all the factors going into that, but we did not get those deep reds and maybe if I had added the calcium carbonate then I would have. Um, yeah, so I will insert that stuff in now. Okay, so these are the two skeins that we are that we dyed. The white is a Rambouillet Corydale Columbia cro uh, mix, and the gray is Jacob. Um, we we ended up splitting the skein in about half. Maybe it was two thirds and one third, something like that. Um, but yeah, we split it in two to keep some of it gray and then to dye some of it in the matter bath as well. So the plan was to have these three colors, the gray and then the white dyed with matter and then the gray dyed with matter. So first we needed to mordant um, the skeins. So this is just, um, I don't know, putting them in that bath. I don't know why it's looking like I'm agitating that water so much. I swear I'm not, but I don't know. Um, so that's just mordantine. Then, so I don't have a picture of it, but we, um, you know, we had the matter roots and, you know, we had simmered them and, um, strained them out. And then this is us, um, first kind of dropping the white skein into it. So, um, some of it hasn't dropped all the way in yet, but there it is. You can see some of that color. And then... What we did is we decided with the gray to try to go for a gradient, which is a new thing for me. I haven't done it like this. Um, I guess I've done a slight gradient. Uh, sorry, I was going to say I've done a gradient with it, some indigo, but I don't think I actually did. Other people that day were, but I didn't. I was just dipping my stuff in. So, yeah, we're, we did a gradient, so kind of dipped it in for a little bit at first, and then, you know, later on dipped it in a little bit farther and farther, etc. And these are the final results. Um, yeah, so there you can see we didn't get that um, that really deep red. Uh, it's more some orangey pinky colors, but still beautiful. So um, Rachel, my sister, she will be uh, knitting herself a little poncho out of it. You know, I I knit that pattern of the poncho before I really knew about designers and all of that stuff, so I don't actually know the name of it. Um, a friend just made one, and so I thought, oh, I'll make one too. And it was so simple, I didn't really need an actual pattern. Um, so I don't, I don't know the name of it or who it's by or anything like that. I should do some research and try to find that out. Um, yeah, but so now my sister will be making one. I've showed mine on here before. Um, it'll be these colors, and then she also was going through my stash and selected a number of other colors as well. So here are they. Um, there's actually a couple more. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that right? Yeah, I guess seven. And I think she ended up having ten. So um, there, there are a couple more. I know there's one that's um, that is also from a matter dye bath. It was the exhaust dye bath, so it's kind of a, a pink. Not as orangey as this, just kind of a light pink. Um, so that'll go with it, and a few other colors kind of in that tone and range. You can kind of see a theme going on there. Um, let's see, at the top, that brown is um, some fiber. I don't know what it is. When I bought my spinning wheel, um, the person was getting rid of lots of stuff. It was her mother's. And... Um, she was getting rid of lots of, of things. That's where, how I bought my wheel. And it, so there were fibers that came with it. And this was what was on the wheel. And one day I spun it up. It's super, um, kind of thick and thin, chunky style. Um, and actually 
my sister was in town when I was spinning that up and she was kind of interested in trying out the spinning wheel and this was the perfect thing. I, I really didn't care, you know, how even or anything it was. So she sat down and, and tried spinning a little bit um, as well. So her very, very first hand spun is on there, which is cool because with my poncho, my very, very first hand spun that I ever, ever did um, is in there as well. So that's fun that she'll get to have that in hers as well. So that's what that brown is. Down below it is some Icelandic, and then of course the Jacob, and the Rambouillet Coria de la Colombia. And then below it, the more fawn colored, mm, I think that's alpaca. She definitely grabbed a few things of alpaca, and that looks just color-wise, that looks like alpaca. Then of course the other, Jacob Gray, and then this is the only one that hasn't spun yet, the one at the bottom, that really, really dark brown. Um, it looks quite black. Um, that is some alpaca, so I'll spin that up and get that to her as well. Um, yeah, so that is what's going to go into her little poncho. Another thing I wanted to share was on the trip um, that I just took up to Wyoming, I stopped, or my husband and I stopped in Du Bois, I think is how they pronounce it, not Du Bois, but Du Bois, uh, Wyoming. Um, we stopped at the thrift store and then I saw that right behind the thrift store there was like this wool crafty place and I was like, ooh, okay. So I went in there. It was really cool. I wish I could have spent more time, but we needed to get going. Um, but I did make a purchase. So, um, the woman who was there, but it's several people who like have this workshop and shop space and stuff, but there was just one woman um, who was part of it who was there. Um, and she had a lot of, a lot of like rug kits, I guess. Um, and they had just like these strips of wool from these Pendleton blankets that I guess, like I was asking more about it because they looked like they were in such nice shape, but I guess they are, um, like the mill ends. Um, yeah. So she takes these and wraps them up and then you can like do different, uh, different rug knotting or crochet or different techniques to make little rugs out of them. Um, I didn't end up getting that stuff, um, but I got some other kind of mill end stuff um, that they get from Pendleton. So here it is. Um, I thought that this was just a ball and I realized that they're actually just like segment upon segment. Um, so yeah, lots of ends here. I got four of these. Look at the color. Sorry, lots of noise. Yeah, so I have this gray, and then I have two that are like this, and then one kind of a little more blue gray or so. So if I can hold these up right in front of my face, I can't see, but you can. Um, I don't know yet what I'll make with these. I've been thinking and pondering about it, and I'm not really sure yet. I kind of want, you know how people have those triangle looms? And you don't even have to have them be a triangle. Like, they're really common to have it be that way, but you can do the same type of weaving technique from with a square. But triangles are nice. I was thinking it could be fun to make, like, a shawl or something, especially that could just be, like, a little ground cloth in the ball or something. I'm not sure. It's one thought. Um, or maybe knitting with it or crocheting. We will see. But I thought that I would share that little acquisition. Okay, I think that's it for the fiber. Um, so on to some garden stuff. Uh, right after I filmed last time, I spent uh, quite a while working in the chicken run area, um, just shoveling that muck out of there and into the compost bin. So I just thought that it could be interesting for people possibly just um, to kind of share how I do the chickens. So we have our chickens in their area. They have a coop in there and then kind of a nice little run. It's, it's the side yard. We have a backyard, a front yard, and then we've sectioned off the side yard for them. Um, it's a pretty nice space for them. And then when we're gone, work, you know, whatever, we put the dogs in the dog kennel in the backyard and then we let the chickens out into the backyard and then they just have a blast. Um, the side yard is a little small for them to be truly, truly happy all the time there. They, they like it, it's their home, but um, 
yeah, they, they need more space than that just to run around and have their dirt baths and all of that. So they get a lot of time in the backyard as well, which is really fun for them and for us. We like seeing them. Um, so what we do compost wise is we have some compost bins out in the backyard. Um, and I guess we used to use them and we still do, but just differently. So now in the house, we just have, you know, a little bucket, um, a little metal bowl actually. And, you know, we just put our compost stuff in there. And then we always just take that and give it straight to the chickens. And the chickens can just sort through and eat whatever they're interested in, anything they're not interested in. You know, they're just walking around and just mixing everything up. Um, and they just make it turn into this stuff and then they poop and we put straw in there and we put our grass clippings in there. Um, and that is the chickens area. So this is just our second year having chickens, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I guess maybe third year. This is like beginning of third. I'm confused because they seem really young still. I swear it's just their second year of laying. But anyway, last year in the spring, we shoveled out all of that hay and poop and compost. You know, it's just all matted together and gets rained on. And we start shoveling it and it gets a little stinky under there. Um, I think we put enough straw on top that it ends up not being stinky all the time. But once you start shoveling, it gets pretty darn stinky. So yeah, just shoveling that into wheelbarrows and then taking that back and putting that in the compost bin. Um, and then I let that sit there for a year. So we did this for our first time last year, we mucked it all out into the compost, let it sit. And then that is the compost that I used this year in the garden. And then again, we've just mucked it all out. The compost is just like full, full, full. It's like full and a half. We have two cause we used to alternate between the two. Um, but now it kind of works differently. So I filled up the one and there still was just more and more and more. So then we filled up another one about halfway. And that's just going to get to sit there um, until next year. And I'm going to have so much wonderful compost. You know, that chicken, chicken muck really does make it super rich and wonderful. Um, so, yeah, I thought that could be interesting for people just to hear that process a little bit. Um, I'll try to put some pictures in too. Oh, the other thing we do when we do that is we, you know, muck them all out and then we move the coop to a different area. Um, and just kind of freshen up the whole, uh, the whole run in there. And it just feels so nice because it does start getting a little crazy after a full year of not doing that. And now it's just beautiful and wonderful and clean out there. And I think we're all happy about it. Um, yeah, so that's the, with the chickens. Um, as far as other gardening stuff, uh, when we got back from our trip last night, I went out into the garden and... I knew the strawberries had been on. I picked um, a bunch before we left, you know, even ones that weren't ripe, but I knew would ripen up. And then we were just eating those the first few days of our trip. And then we were gone for a week and a half. And I encouraged my mom and sister who were still in town to, you know, be picking it. I'm not sure if they did um, pick many strawberries or not. I think so. Otherwise, I think there'd be more that would be rotting at this point. We got home last night and just picked and picked and picked and picked and picked and just got a giant bowl full of strawberries. So been eating on those. And I'm sure if I went out today, like I wasn't even being that picky at getting like every single one um, with red on it. Cause I do like to pick them early before they start getting eaten by slugs and pill bugs. Um, yeah, so I'm sure I could go out today and pick a bunch more, but I figure I'll give it a couple more days and then go out again and just kind of be working on eating these ones up. So tons of strawberries. I also came back. My peas, before I left, they hadn't flowered or anything, but came back and had all sorts of peas. Um, and they're still flowering, so they're on. Radishes are great big giant things. Um, one thing I'll say for people who don't quite know what to do with radishes. They're great fresh, of course, although some people don't like them, that's okay too. Try cooking them, try sauteing them. Um, they are delicious. Eat them up that way. It's a really fabulous way when you have tons of radishes. You're like, ah, oh, what do I do with all these radishes? Just like saute them up and make them with whatever other veggies you'd be having. Um, really good. I also just tried a new thing, uh, cause I had just gathered uh, before we left I had gathered a bunch of radishes and I need to do more. They're starting to bolt and everything. Um, um, 
so I was cooking them up and we had some fresh and all of that and I had all these greens and you know greens can be good in salads and in different things but they, they are a little bit fuzzy um, they kind of have like some hairs that can be a little prickly so they're not amazing just to have tons and tons of so I looked up some recipes for different things to do with them and I came across um, radish leaf pesto so I decided to give it a try. I happened to have just like little bits of all the ingredients that I needed. Um, got to finish off some pine nuts and some Parmesan and all sorts of things. It worked out really well. It is good. It's very different. People really warn you. It's really different than um, basil pesto. And other people like put in sugar to compensate for that or something. I I was hoping that I wouldn't have to put in sugar and you know I just made it up and thought okay you know if if I taste it and I need to put sugar in then okay or maybe I put some honey in um, but let's try it without it doesn't need sugar at least mine certainly didn't um, but it has such an interesting taste because it does have that like spice to it you know but then also with the garlic and with the salt and parmesan I don't know it just it was pretty delicious so we brought that on our trip and had some nice yummy pasta with pesto and I had some beets and stuff so that was a fun little meal to eat one night um yeah so I keep wanting to say rhubarb no radish leaf pesto give it a shot um what else is on so I have been picking the onions they're not like fully formed yet but especially for ones that have bolted I just grab them and chop up the little root and have all sorts of green onions it's super yummy um Lettuce is on, although mine are still pretty small. I went out today and kind of just thinned them out, um, and so I'll make a little salad with, with the thinnings today. Um, but yeah, those are coming out pretty well. It's been such a cool spring and summer so far, um, but we are warming up, and yeah. Um, I guess the other thing I want to say is normally summer solstice is the time to harvest garlic, um, mine's not quite ready yet, I think again because it has been cool would be my guess. Um, it's getting ready but it's not, it's not there yet so, uh oh, because I was, I've been kind of using up a lot of my garlic from last year's harvest because um, I had a number of, of bulbs still left um, and so I've just been using them up like pretty darn fast because I thought, oh, I'm going to be harvesting again. And I'm like, oh, I only have one bulb left and I'm not harvesting yet. So I guess I'll have to go a little bit more sparing on the garlic. Um, yeah, in the backyard, the fruit trees are just growing, getting bigger and bigger, but nothing's really, nothing's really on yet there. So yeah, that's kind of what's going on gardening wise. I want to spend some time out there getting some weeding going on. Bindweed is the bane of my existence. Um, yeah, it's flowering a lot and you know, you can only battle so much, but right now I figure, ah, it's actually competing in the garden space, in the grass, I mm, can't really worry, but right now it's like, yes, I can go out there and, and pick all these darn flowers that are gonna be going to seed in a minute. So yeah, that's what's going on here. Um, I think that's everything. All right. See you guys next time. Bye-bye.